Good morning, Valley View. Good morning. A couple of announcements to make before we get started this morning. The first is, is that I want to thank you on behalf of the elders, the congregation, myself, the staff, for the abundance of generosity that you showed last week. In regard to our resident minister training program, we received in excess of $18,000 over the budget, which gives us a wonderful start to this program. And that also shows your support and your excitement. A number of you have expressed that excitement. And even today, there have been a few more contributions towards that effort. Um, we're setting that money aside, so in the future, if you ever want to give towards that effort, uh, there's a place to do so. All you have to do is note that on your gift. But we just are so, so appreciative and thankful. And who knows what God can do with this? Because a little bit of faith, the Lord says, can do what? Can move mountains. And you have shown faith, and we're appreciative so much. Also, I'd like to encourage you, if you would, we haven't done this in a while, but we have encouragement notes in the pew in front of you. And we have boxes, well, I know we at least have one box over here at the back of the auditorium right in front of the nursery. So if you'd like to fill out, just write an encouraging note to someone in the congregation that you just want to tell them you appreciate them or that they've encouraged you or, or just anything to build someone up. Go ahead and fill that out, fold it in half and put it in the, in the box at the back of the auditorium. We also want to tell you about m, &M groups today. They start back up. We're excited about that. So if your name starts with A through L, you're welcome to stay and we'll enjoy some fellowship. And also, if you're a visitor, we'd like for you to stay with us as well, regardless of what your last name is. You're still invited if you're a visitor. And finally, all of you who are in pairs and spares, or if you're a golden ager or a senior saint or whatever other label that you would like to consider yourself as, um, if you're an older member of this congregation, my wife and I, Lenora, would like to invite you to our home next Sunday afternoon from 2 to 4. We're going to have an open house with finger foods and a little bit of fellowship. It's a come and go affair. So we'd like you to come and share a little time with us at our home and have and become our guest for that afternoon. So next Sunday from 2 to 4 for all of our parents and spares, senior saints. Turn your Bibles if you would to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. As I was teaching through in our class in the elders' conference room over this last quarter, we were discussing spiritual warfare. And basically we talked about the devil and, and demons and angels and the spiritual war and the armor of God that God has provided for us through which to fight. And all of these things that we know are there but are difficult to see and to touch and to hear because they're intangibles. They're in the spiritual world. But one thing that continued to amaze me is as we talked about the devil and who he is and what he's about, I came upon a principle that I guess I knew in my mind before, but it never put the puzzle pieces together. And I wanted to share it with you today because it was a sobering and a challenging truth to me. And it caused me to have to do a little repentance in my own life and to decide to do different and to try to be more like Christ in this way. We start in Ephesians chapter 6, 12, where it tells us that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the princes, principalities, and powers of wickedness in the heavenly places. So there's a war. There's a great, epic, eternal conflict that's going on between God, the forces of good, and Satan, the forces of evil. Keep that in your mind as I share with you this illustration. Has there ever been a time when you've been... Oh, I know there's been a time. That was a silly rhetorical question. Remember back to a time when you were in an argument, a debate, a discussion, heated discussion with someone, and you had an ally on your side. Maybe you're debating with your children, and you and your wife are sitting there together having this conversation. And remember a time, because this has happened to all of us, when the person you thought was on your side, could be your husband or wife or spouse, and the other person makes a point and your ally says, well, that's a good point. Or turns to you and says, well, you know, he or she has a point there. I hadn't thought of it that way. Have you ever, Corey, smile, you had that happen? Happens on a daily basis in my house, right? Because I'm usually the wrong one. You know, when you have those discussions, isn't that frustrating? You know what we do? We turn to that person and we say, I thought you were here to support me. Whose side are you on anyway? Whose side are you on? That's the question I want to 
us to consider this morning. Whose side are you on? You know, the problem in that scenario is that the person that you expect to share your argument or to share your reasoning agrees with the argument or reasoning of your opponent. Do we ever do that? And I have to look at this honestly, so I'm not just calling this more as a review to all of you. I've looked at this and reflected on, on this myself. Do we ever do that? Do we ever agree with the devil's position? Do we ever voice anything that supports his approach? Does God ever have reason to look at us and say, whose side are you on anyway? With that in mind, look with me in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 12. Revelation chapter 12, 7 through 12. And there was a war in heaven, and Michael and his angels warred against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels warred. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down and accuses them before God day and night. Now it talks about the devil in great detail here. And it describes it in different ways. It calls the devil Satan, the devil, the one who deceives the world, the great deceiver, but notice, notice the title, the label that the voice from heaven that God gives the devil. You know who God sees him as? He is the accuser. The accuser. Now keep that in mind and let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7 to verse 25. Where it says, hence also he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives, this is Christ Jesus, always lives. That is his purpose, that is his existence, that is why he came, that is his identifier, that is who he is. He always lives to make intercession for them. So the title, the description, the identifier given to the devil is he is the Accuser. The title, the description, the identifier given to Jesus is He is the intercessor. What's the difference between the two? Well, imagine a court of law. In a court of law, there's an accuser. It's the prosecutor. And there's an intercessor. It's the defendant. And the accused is one that the prosecutor will look and try to find every flaw. Every weakness, every shortcoming, and he will, and this is the key to accusing, he will point them out. He will make them known. But what is the intercessor? The intercessor oftentimes will know that his client has flaws. He may even know his client is guilty. Like our intercessor knows that his clients are guilty. Amen? But yet the intercessor tries to deflect the blame, doesn't he? He tries to excuse the actions. He tries to find ways that this person is not accountable for those accusations. And we call that sleazy lawyering in our world, and God calls it being the savior of a sinful world. Doesn't he? Because that is precisely what's going to happen with the judgment day for each and every one of us that are in Christ Jesus. We are going to stand before God guilty literally as sin. And the devil is going to point. And he's going to pull up every flaw and every shortcoming and every weakness. And he's not just going to observe it. He's going to point it out. 
Make it your will. And Jesus is going to do His best, which will be enough, to deflect the blame to Himself rather than us. He's going to do His best to make us unaccountable for that with which we know, and He knows, and God knows, and the devil knows, that we are profoundly guilty. Is that not the different positions in which we find God in the devil? Is that not the ultimate conflict of the ages? The accuser and the intercessor. Now we have to ask here an important question. A sobering question that is uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable for me when I put this all together to ask myself. Whose side am I on? If God were to listen to my words, if God were to observe my attitudes and observe my actions, Am I more of an accuser or am I more of an intercessor? Do I observe the faults in people and point them out and make them known? Or do I do my best all the time to deflect the blame and to find the good in people rather than the bad? And to de-emphasize their weaknesses and to accept and build up their strengths. Which do I do? As God looks at my life, as I deal with you and as you deal with me, does God see someone who is always trying to give people the benefit of the doubt? Who is always trying to excuse their weaknesses? Or does God see someone who's always finding fault and pointing it out? Because there's no way around it. That is the work of the devil. That's who and what he is. That's what he does. And if I find myself in that role, it's entirely believable that God would turn to me and say, Whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? Because that's the devil's argument. That's the devil's reasoning. That's what the devil does. That's not what Jesus is. That's not what Jesus does. You see, as we ask this question, we have to ask whose work are we doing? What attitude are we living? What actions, what do our actions reveal about our heart in which we'd like to be more like? You see, who we follow is an issue of our lifestyle, not our labels. It's not about the name that we wear when we say, I'm a Christian, therefore I'm identified with Christ. It's not about the name on the door of the building that we attend once or twice or even three times a week. It's about what we do and how we act. And do our actions reflect that of an intercessor or that of an accuser? Accusation comes so naturally to us. All of us are critics in our hearts. Don't we find little things that annoy us that we point out that we, to ourselves or that we see? Well, we, we can't really find that reality, but what we can do is stop the second process of being an accuser. We might know it in our mind, but we don't have to reveal it. We don't have to point it out. See, God knows all of our weaknesses. He knows them better than we do. The difference between him and the devil is he doesn't point it out. He doesn't make note of it. He doesn't reveal it, bring it to the surface. Accusation comes naturally, but our job is to intercede. That's what this text in 1 Timothy 2 is about today. When it talks about from Paul's perspective, what Timothy is to do and to be, when he says in verse 1, that was read for us a moment ago, first of all, then I urge you 
with the entreats, entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men. He says, I want you to go to the throne of God and I want you to intercede. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the first thing we did when we saw something that was a weakness in another brother is we prayed and brought it up to God rather than bringing it up to them or to others? That's what it means to intercede. To ask God, Lord, I know this brother has this weakness, but help him, Lord. Lord, bless him. Help him to change. Help him to do better. That's who we need to point it out to. But yet it's so easy to point it out and be an accuser rather than one who gives intercession. You see, there was a, I read a man one time who was being criticized by a sister in the church. And his response to her was profound. She was pointing on this, 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 this. And his response, rather than to defend his actions or to try to deflect the blame, he said, well, if what you say is true, sister, I beg you, pray for me. Pray for me. Have you been praying for me? To which she was stumped. I have no response. You see, the Chinese proverb is abundantly true. Let the man who says it cannot be done not disturb the man doing it. How profound is that? When we look back at Zechariah 13, 7, there's an interesting text where this is talking about all through chapter 13, the caption of your Bible will say false prophets ashamed. And he talks about what these prophets are like. And it says in verse 7, Awake my sword against my shepherd and against the man who is my associate. In verse 6, he says, I was wounded in the house of my friends. He's talking about being accused, even from those who are supposed to be our intercessors. Imagine you're in that court of law and you've been accused and the prosecutor is saying he's guilty and your defense attorney is saying he's guilty. What would you do? We're supposed to be intercessors. Always on each other's side. Because that's what Jesus is like. But when we find fault, and when we point it out, we are accusers. And that's what the devil is like. I'll close this morning with simply this quick illustration. There was a man named Admiral Phipps, who was an admiral in the British Navy when they were warring in the 1750s over the North American continent with the French. And he was, he had all of his ships in, at anchor in the bay, outside I think it was Montreal. And he was waiting for the ground troops to come and their orders were to support the ground troops with a bombardment of the city as the British troops would land. But the admiral was the admiral was very frustrated because every morning he would wake up and he'd look from the bow of his ship and he'd see the great cathedral. And as you know, the English they were Protestant and the French they were Catholic, and so there's this Catholic cathedral and it had all of these statues, these saints, if you will. And he became so frustrated he ordered his gunmen to fire volley after volley and to knock down every one of those statues. And history tells us that when the ground troops arrived, he was of no aid. Now listen to this statement. Because Admiral Phipps had used up all of his ammo firing at the saints. So he had nothing with which to support in the real fight. There is a profound lesson to be learned from that, is there not? So we simply ask the question today, whose side are you on? You know, we, we think critical things. I don't know if we can help that. What can help them is choosing to point them out, to accent them, to bring them to the surface. Rather, let us be a people who take those criticisms and prayer to God. One on one, that's of God. And when God asks us, whose side are you on? We can say, I'm on the side of the intercessor, not the accuser.
If you need to respond this morning, I had to do some self-reflection on this topic myself. If you need to make any changes in this regard, if you just want to say, you know, I want to be a more positive person. I don't want to look at the negative in people. I want to just accept the positive and intercede before God. I don't want to do the work of the devil, the accuser. I want to do the work of my Jesus, the intercessor. Don't do that. Choose a change of attitude today. If you need anything else, if you need to come to Christ Jesus, be baptized in His name, whatever it is, come right now as we stand.